Our guest today is Professor Odel Brun Chudi from the University of Oslo in Norway. You are well known in Scandinavia because of your many works on Asian countries, especially China and Japan. And I like to show some of the books you've been writing. For instance, Japan Solokomens Land, The Land of the Sunset, Sunrise. Sunrise. Sunrise from 1957. Uh, you also wrote an important part in the book Asia, whose editor was a Swedish professor, a large chapter on China and Japan. You've been participating in a Norwegian book for school use. And the last one, which came just a couple of months ago, describes your childhood in China partly and also how it was to come back to China after many years together with your sisters and your brother. Your interest in the Asian countries is due to the fact that you spend your life as a young girl in China where your parents were missionaries. And uh, how was it then to come back to Norway after so many years in China? It was a bad shock. At that time we settled down in a small town in the southeastern part of Norway where the Norwegian Missionary Society had a property and so we could stay there rather cheaply and it was an industrial town and very much dominated by socialism and social de dem democrats and they were not particularly friendly towards uh, mission and at that time very few Norwegians knew much about mission work at all. The climate is entirely different now because Norwegians know more about developing countries and it was a, a very, very bad shock. Uh, I can uh, give it as an example that we were being missionaries, we were poor, it took some time before we got uh, Norwegian equipment and the fir very first day I went to the bookshop with uh, uh, that uh, the kind of uh, umbrellas, so the Chinese used paper and bamboo umbrellas where the, the paper was oil and uh, <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, I created quite a, 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 a commotion both in the bookshop and in the streets and my brother, he came home with the very first day, it was rather cold, we came from China, subtropical part of China and it, my mother dressed us the way we used to go in China before she got Norwegian dresses and he had long gowns like the Chinese had and he came back, came home with a gown torn and the boys, the bigger boys, they had taken him apart in the schoolyard and stripped him naked to see whether he was a boy or a girl. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, his experience was harder than the experiences of any other of us. I don't, uh, I think that should be enough to show some of the climate that we encountered. Uh, did you uh, <laughs> speak very much about your uh, <coughs> Chinese experience then as a young girl or as a student in Oslo later on? No. And uh, uh, I had many shocks uh, among uh, the very, very first uh, lesson or a class in, uh, in, in school that was uh, senior high school. I was asked by the teacher in, uh, in Norwegian to read a passage from uh, our uh, book, a textbook. And I read the passage and he said, ah, listen to her, she can read Norwegian fluently and she reads better than most of you and of course I was so ashamed I <laughs> wanted to hide and these kind of experiences they uh, accumulated so when I left uh, the high school and entered university in Oslo uh, I met new people you know and I was very happy because uh, then I could hide, no one knew my background. 
And for many years, I never spoke of my background if I could help it. Well, um, uh, how do you think that the uh, knowledge you have and you had of two different types of culture uh, has had, had any influence on your work later on as a geographer? I do think that the experience of uh, having uh, um, grown up in an entirely different culture which entered my bones, so to speak. I was educated by, taken care of by a Chinese ama, as well as by my mother, perhaps uh, even more. She had even more influence on me than my mother because my mother was a teacher and she was working all the time as a teacher, teaching Chinese women to read and, and whatnot. And of course, uh, teaching them about uh, the Christianity and the Bible and New Testament and so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, the fact that this Chinese culture entered my bones has uh, had an influence which is very hard to trace and to express, but it has uh, made me m more understanding of uh, different cultures at all. So it makes, to me, it makes entirely sense and that uh, I, in my uh, old age, has got the responsibility to build up uh, development studies in geography uh, at our university. So that's one of my uh, responsibilities for, for the time being. You just told us that you've been building up uh, this special course in developing countries at the Department of Geography. Could you tell us something more about how you did this work and why you did it? Well, I did it because uh, there was a, a position, a, a professorate with, uh, uh, with um, special reference to developing countries and I applied for it. I was a sort of uh, asked to apply for it and even though uh, Chinese was my main interest and uh, I had done more work in uh, Far Eastern uh, as a Far Eastern specialist both uh, in uh, I was then in the Department of uh, or the Institute of East Asian uh, Studies uh, our university uh, both, both in that capacity and previously in the capacity of foreign news analyst with the Far East as my specialty in Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation. I had mainly worked on uh, China and the Far East, but even so I was sufficiently interested in the, the, the problems of developing countries generally in order to apply for this uh, professorship and I got it. And, so this has been my responsibility for a number of years. And, but it has been a, a kind of hard uphill job, I must say. But uh, uh, I've had some very nice young research fellows and assistants. And we've had a very good uh, team uh, working together. And the students have been very responsive and interesting. So I've had a grand time working with these students and the research fellows. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, this has led you to visit various other countries uh, outside the Asian part of the world. Do you think that the young students uh, who are coming back from developing countries as geographers or sociologists or something else, could bring back knowledge useful for Norwegian or Scandinavian planners and for the Scandinavian society in general? I do think it uh, should be possible and uh, it's one of the aims that uh, I've been working towards, but uh, I don't think it's feasible or practical for a number of years yet because I don't think that uh, uh, it's uh, uh, there's a sufficient uh, response, sufficient understanding to uh, of, uh, to to make this kind of uh, exchange possible. But uh, 
We uh, have experimented in our department uh, last autumn because I had a uh, sabbatical and uh, a professor in geography from Sri Lanka with whom uh, my uh, research uh, fellows, my uh, companions, with whom they had uh, cooperated in Sri Lanka. He came as a regular uh, substitute and entered uh, and to, took part in our regular work as a lecturer uh, and uh, took over my responsibilities. And it was quite a success, but he was exceptionally good. He spoke clear, fine English, and the students were very responsive. And as uh, proof of his success, I can say that uh, he ended off with as big an, uh, an audience as when he started, and that's rare. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. You have spent many years working in the very house where we are now making this recording, the house of the Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation. And I think it's a very happy and fortunate coincidence that we can sit here together and chat today. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about your work um, um, in the 1950s as a special correspondent with the Asian problems here in Oslo? I've had a, a career which is not so usual anymore among women because now it's more usual for uh, women in the academic field to continue their studies and research work and teaching and whatnot continuously. But I had a break when I married and got children. I spent uh, uh, time mostly in my, my house with the household chores and with the children and so on and so forth. And on top of this, my husband was a clergyman. So I thought that sooner or later I will have to enter into the responsibilities of a minister's wife. But uh, it so happened that uh, uh, he, uh, he, he mainly worked with the church paper. And uh, that was not necessary. So uh, when uh, I just happened to be asked to um, try a program here in this house, I was uh, uh, more than 40 years. And then I started and it, it, it went all right. But I uh, felt that I needed some formal training. And then I eventually took my uh, degree and uh, I, my um, boys were big enough to come and listen to the orals. The orals uh, were then and are then public. And uh, so I, um, I uh, got a, a kind of formal appointment, not regularly working every day in this house, but uh, in um, a team of foreign news analysts. I had Far East as my special field, but also Sometimes I, when it was uh, um, ne necessary or uh, important, I also um, analyzed news from African countries and so on and so forth. All it uh, more or less depended on circumstances, what was needed. And uh, is, is that what you want or do you want me to...? Well, then how, how did you uh, then become a geographer? Switching well, from Norwegian broadcasting to... Uh, that was, I, I, I felt the need for a formal training. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had started studying geography, but never finished my, my degree, mm -hmm. because I married. And as I said, then there was, was a time when there was much uh, unemployment among uh, theological candidates, and my husband ended up as a... Uh, uh, an assistant teacher in a, a small, um, well, what would you call the secondary school in the northern part of Norway. It was not so easy. But I was all the time interested in geography, and I started some research on the settlement geography in that part of the country, uh, a very remote valley which was populated from the southeastern part of Norway in the the end of the 17th and beginning of 18th century, mm -hmm. because then Norwegian farmers were very poor. 
and there was a lot of immigration from southeastern part of Norway up to the very northernmost part of the country. And uh, so I was all the time interested in geography, but uh, as I said, my career was discontinuous because of um, circumstances, marriage and so on and so forth, and uh, um, I didn't finish until after I had started working as a foreign news analyst here in this house. And then it was quite natural for me to to take geography as my subject for my final degree. Mm -hmm. And uh, it and also quite natural to to um, concentrate on the Far East. And it so happened that in this house the my uh, uh, the man who had that job before me, he died. So I could just enter a vacancy, mm -hmm. so to speak. Yeah. Uh, I um, understand that in this book, Asia, there is a, a chapter which you are especially fond of. You said to me that uh, you think this is one of the best things you've been doing. Uh, could you explain why you like this this work of yours and, and uh, mm. so? Yeah, I have been especially interested in uh, uh, the Chinese agriculture and how it's organized and uh, uh, the, uh, um, the the huge work and also uh, the in, uh, inputs in agriculture in China after. 1949, after what the Chinese say, uh, call the liberation in 1949, and I do agree, it was a liberation, not only a revolution, it was more than that. And so I, that's my longest chapter on the, um, what they have, um, the, what they have succeeded in doing with, I, I, within the field of agricultural production, productivity, and also uh, in the people's communes, organizing agriculture so that this um, this um, progress was possible. I do think it's much due to the the, the very admirable way that they have organized uh, peasants in people's communes for a collective work in able to improve the infrastructure in agriculture and improve the uh, capacity, the capability of, uh, of Chinese agriculture. And so that's the chapter I am, uh, uh, I think, I, I, where I've been most successful. Did you draw your, um, um, the knowledge you had from your childhood in China, did you use it uh, to produce this? Partly from my childhood, because my father was very much interested in uh, the uh, the farming uh, farming system and in agriculture, and he was a trained uh, gardener before he studied theology, and also had a, um, a small firm for a couple of years in between his uh, ending of his high school and f before he entered university. So he had some background for really understanding the plight of the Chinese peasants at that time and why agriculture was so intensive and also what the landlords and the landlord system did to all the peasants in the, by way of, I would say, enslaving them. Uh, in. Um, uh, and he, I was uh, the oldest of uh, seven uh, sisters and one brother, and uh, so I was sometimes allowed to walk with my father. He never let the Chinese carry him in sedan chairs, as was the usual at that time. My mother was so weak after all her childbirth, and uh, she also had some sickness, so she always were carried by for in a sedan chair with four carriers, and I was old enough to be able to walk with my father, and he explained to me, look at this and that, and that's why they do it, and how they do it, and so on and so forth. So my interest in agriculture was 
uh, initiated by my father and uh, um, then uh, I have also been interested in agricultural questions and rural settlement in Norway as a geographer. So uh, I have uh, done uh, some uh, research on uh, uh, on rural uh, questions and settlement in Norway as well as in China and they, the two tie uh, in together and of course it's very natural to uh, occupy oneself mainly with Chinese agriculture in a, l a land in a country like China where 80% or more of the population is living in the countryside and uh, working in, in farming in one capacity or the other. Well, uh, this was about uh, this book. Is there any other book that you would like to talk about? Any other work of yours that you are very fond of, which you think is a, which you, you consider to be a success? It doesn't have to be a public success. It's something you feel is about. Yes, I've done something on the Norwegian rural settlement which I like very much, and also on, on tomato growing mm -hmm. in the southwestern part of Norway. Uh, and I just happened to, to uh, um, travel um, in, uh, through one of the fjords in southwestern part of Norway with my husband. And then I happened to see how many hot glass houses, hot houses there were. And I wondered, it was a strange agrarian landscape uh, with my interest in agriculture and rural settlement ties also in an interest in uh, the human-made landscapes. And this was a very strange landscape and so I went back and uh, for a number of years I did research and, and that's a, a major, uh, what would you call it, article paper on the, uh, tomato growing on these islands and why they have settled on tomato growing and uh, the size of the business and uh, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, I would also like to ask you, Orl, if you could tell us something of the persons that could be teachers or colleagues or relatives or any other who have inspired you in your work, uh, who given you the ideas in your research, and could you also explain why they were so important? Then I must start off with my dear husband, because I was studying, um, I had taken exams in uh, history and uh, English language and was studying the Norwegian language. And I was uh, engaged at that time and my fiancée said, I don't understand why you are working with Norwegian language, which is so boring to you. Why don't you study geography? And so I switched over to geography and found that extremely absorbing and interesting. And I was fortunate to have uh, as my teacher then, uh, and now Professor Emeritus in our university, his name is Fritjof Isaksen, and he is well known in, uh, in international uh, among geographers internationally, particularly perhaps in, in France and in Sweden, but also in other countries. And he encouraged me very much. And it was partly due to his encouragement or his suggestion that I took up geography after I had started as a foreign news analyst in this house. That was in 1951. He came to my home and said, oh, you have written articles on uh, political subjects on uh, East Asia, but I like more what you have written on geography. Why don't you finish your degree? And so it was a, a kind of a challenge from the outside, which uh, corresponded to an urge, inner urge. I don't know whether I would have the courage or the insistence or the uh, to to take it up if it hadn't been for these encouragements from other people. Mm -hmm. From your husband. And I would also like to mention the fact that uh, the then head of the foreign news department, uh, uh, Toraf Öksnevad, who meant very much to all Norwegians, I should say, during the Second World War, because he was 
head of the he, he ran uh, that department of the Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation, which was located in Great Britain, and they sent programs to Norway. He was also very encouraging right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. I've um, noticed that uh, you are the only woman at the Department of Human Geography in Oslo. How is it to be a woman among so many men? I must admit that it has been uh, um, like my work to develop uh, uh, the geography of uh, developing countries. It has been an uphill job, yeah. rather uphill. <laughs> but uh, I don't think uh, there is any reason why you should uh, expand on that subject. I think uh, I have uh, my experience corresponds very much to the experience of other uh, women in my age who have uh, not had uh, the possibilities and the encouragement that young women have nowadays. I do think I'm still the only women geographer in a senior position. I know there is an assistant in one of the other departments in Norway, but I don't think that any permanently applied uh, uh, academic geography, who, who is a woman, mm -hmm. so far. I thank you very much for this little chat, and I also would like to thank the Swedish, the Norwegian radio for giving us the opportunity of talking together. Thank you.